This is experimental investigation number nine for Novari Physical Science. In this experiment, we're going to go through a sequence of six chemical reactions, and students are going to observe and document their observations at each step. This is one of the more complex sequences of uh, experimental work that occur in the book. So this is one of those experiments where some people might not want to go to the trouble to set up and conduct this experiment. So we're preparing this video so that students can see the entire sequence uh, in action, even if you can't do this experiment yourself. If you do want to do this experiment, there are some important safety concerns. You notice I'm wearing nitrile gloves and safety goggles, which should always be done when you're mixing chemicals. Um, I also uh, don't have loose hair hanging down and uh, loose clothing, so there are, many, there are a number of safety concerns that you should be aware of. These are all listed in our experiment resource manual, which is available uh, from Novare Science and Math on our website uh, to go with the uh, users of this book. Even though there are safety concerns, I still want to emphasize this is a very fun experiment to do, and I hope as many as possible will be able to do it. We're doing it in a kitchen today instead of a chemistry lab because a lot of the people who use our books are homeschoolers. So whether you're at home or whether you're in a chemistry lab, this experiment is easy to do if you'll just pay attention to the safety precautions that are outlined that I mentioned. So our first reaction that we're going to do in the sequence of six reactions is make two solutions, one copper sulfate solution and one solution of sodium hydroxide. I have a mass balance here in front of me and I have two weighing dishes to use for measuring out the weights of these chemicals and some plastic spoons to use for mixing the solutions. If you don't have weighing dishes, no problem. You can use coffee filters. So, but you do need a mass balance. So I'm going to put a weighing dish on the balance, and I'm going to zero the balance with the dish on it. That way, it's reading zero, and I can just read off the mass that I need. So I'm going to weigh out 10 grams of copper sulfate in this tray and 10 grams of sodium hydroxide in this tray. We'll begin with the copper sulfate. By the way, the copper sulfate is not particularly dangerous. This chemical is used in fountains to pre prevent algae growth, so it's uh, not particularly hazardous. The other one we need to be more careful with. So I went up to 10 and a half grams, which is fine. For this, these experiments, the measurements are not critical to be precise. So I've got 10 and a half grams of copper sulfate. Now I'm going to weigh out 10 grams of sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is what used to be called lye. We used to make soap out of it. It's quite harsh and you do not want to get this on your skin. Again, you need to wear gloves. Latex gloves will work but it's common these days for people to use nitrile gloves uh, because of latex allergies that are common. So here I got my 10 and a half grams of sodium hydroxide. I was shooting for 10. 10 and a half is fine. I should mention one more thing about safety gear. If students are watching this experiment in person, the actual mixing and heating of the ingredients uh, should be done by an adult. If students are watching the experiment up close, like just within a couple of feet, they should be wearing safety glasses in case of an accident. If they're farther away than three or four or five feet, then it would be fine for them to watch at some distance without wearing the safety glasses. But if they're up close, they need glasses and like these. And if they are mixing, then they also need to wear the nitrile gloves or latex gloves. So now I'm gonna make solutions of these two compounds. You measure out the liquid in this instrument. This is called a graduated cylinder. There are scales uh, up and down, so I'm going to use the scale going from down to up, and I'm going to measure out 75 milliliters 
of distilled water. We need to use distilled water because regular tap water contains compounds, dissolved salts that will uh, that don't belong in these chemical reactions. So we're, we bought a gallon of distilled water from the grocery store. So I'm going to fill this up to the 75 milliliter mark. Which is there. Again, the exact amounts for this experiment are not critical. But this probably is a good time to inform your students the proper way to read a volume on a graduated cylinder. With the cylinder sitting on a level surface, you need to position your eye to be horizontal looking at the liquid. Water in a graduated cylinder makes a bowl-shaped surface at the top of the liquid. That surface is called a meniscus. So the right way to read the liquid in a graduated cylinder is to look horizontally and look at the bottom of the meniscus to make your measurement. I've got about 73 milliliters in here, which is fine. So I'm going to transfer this to this beaker. This is a 250 milliliter beaker. And I'm going to pour in the sodium hydroxide using a plastic spoon to make sure all the pellets go in. And I will stir this with this plastic spoon until it's dissolved, which will take about 10 minutes. And this whey tray needs to be discarded. Now I'm going to make another solution with the copper sulfate the same way. So now I'm going to do it again. I'm going to mix up, I'm going to pour 75 milliliters of distilled water. I need to turn this where I can see it. If the amount of water was a critical factor, then it would be important for me to make a careful measurement of the water and record it in my lab journal uh, each, at each step. So now I'm going to pour this water into a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. I mixed the sodium hydroxide in a beaker. I'm mixing the uh, copper sulfate in a flask. And now I'll pour in the copper sulfate. This whey tray should also be discarded, and this can be mixed by swirling. If you do not have a beaker and a flask, the, this experiment can easily be done using a couple of mason jars or uh, other glasses. This is going to take about 15 minutes of swirling this before this compound is dissolved. So we'll be back as soon as these are dissolved. Looks like the copper sulfate is finally dissolved. So I've got the sodium hydroxide solution, the copper sulfate solution, and our first chemical reaction will occur when we combine these two solutions, which I'm now going to do by pouring the copper sulfate solution from this flask into the beaker. There is a nice precipitate that has formed in this reaction. It looks like there's a washcloth in the water. It's a large, fuzzy-looking mass that formed in the solution. That is copper hydroxide. It's fuzzy and thick and solid-looking. The sodium sulfate is still dissolved in the clear solution, but copper hydroxide is not soluble. So it precipitated, and that's what that solid stuff is. Now we're going to filter the copper hydroxide out of the solution. I have a plastic funnel and a larger flask. And for filter paper, I'm just using a coffee filter. 
Now I'm going to pour the copper hydroxide and the solution it's in into the filter uh, paper in this funnel. When you do this, you should always hold the funnel. I even saw a YouTube video once where the guy didn't hold it and the whole thing fell over. So holding this now, I'm going to pour this in. So you can see the copper hydroxide now. It's a brilliant blue color and it's going to take a while for the water to drain out of this. We're going to set this aside now because it's going to take a couple of days for all the water to drain out of this. We will need what's left for reaction number six in our chain of six chemical reactions. So we'll come back to that. Now we'll proceed to mix up the solutions for reaction number two. Now we're ready to measure out the chemicals for the second chemical reaction. This time we're going to make two solutions just as we did before. One of them will again be copper sulfate, so you'll have another 20 minutes of stirring. The other one will be baking soda or sodium bicarbonate. This does not dissolve very well in water, regardless how much you stir it. As before, we will weigh out 10 grams of each. So we'll start with the copper sulfate. Zero the balance after you put your weigh tray on and pour out 10 grams of copper sulfate. All right. Now we'll measure out the sodium bicarbonate. This is just regular kitchen baking soda. That time I poured a little more than I wanted, so I'm going to take some of this back with this clean spoon that I have. All right, now we're ready to make solutions of these. As before, I will measure out 75 milliliters of water in the graduated cylinder. I'll pour that into the beaker, add the sodium bicarbonate, and do the same for the copper sulfate. That's a little too much water. I'm going to step to the sink, pour a bit out. There we go. This is the sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate does not dissolve well in water, so the best we can do is kind of swirl it until it's suspended in the water, and then we'll do the reaction. This is the copper hydroxide we made in the first reaction. I've spread it out in this tray so that it can dry. Notice it's losing its beautiful blue color, starting to turn brown in some spots. Now I'm going to combine these two solutions. I have the sodium bicarbonate, which I'm continuing to stir to keep it sort of suspended in there. The copper sulfate is dissolved, so now I'm going to combine them. Not too quickly. If you add too quickly, that will happen. <laughs> That's okay. We have plenty. Just don't do that. <laughs> I'll add the rest. What gas is that coming out? When you see bubbles happening in an experiment, it means a gas is being released. In this case, carbon dioxide. So I'm cleaning up the carbon copper carbonate solution that, that uh, spilled over. Um, that's what this light blue precipitate is that's formed in here. You don't have to worry about throwing this in the trash. Copper carbonate is completely harmless. 
In fact, it's the main ingredient in verdigris that forms on copper statues out when they're out in the weather. Now I'm going to take the product of our reaction, which is carbor, copper carbonate, and there's also sodium sulfate in solution, but the copper carbonate is not in solution. It's a precipitate. Although it looks like it's dissolved, it's not. So I'm going to pour it in this filter, which as before is a coffee filter and a funnel in a flask, and I'm going to hold on to it so it doesn't fall over. We can use this in just a few minutes after most of the liquid drains down into the flask, and we'll be ready to do reaction number three. So we've let the copper carbonate filter and drain in the flask here for about 10 minutes, and most of the water is gone. So we're ready to transfer it into this frying pan where we're going to cook it. For this portion of the experiment, I would advise an old frying pan, maybe one where the Teflon has been scratched, if uh, you have one that's kind of beat up because you're certainly not going to want to cook in this anymore after you do this. And I've got a spatula here. Long ago the handle broke off of it. This is perfect for this. The spatula that you use does need to be metal because the scraping you're going to do in the pan uh, is pretty vigorous and a wooden or a plastic spatula will not work. So find an old metal spatula. So now I'm going to transfer the copper carbonate into the frying pan. As you can see, there's still a lot of water in this, and that'll be the first thing that happens when we start cooking it, is boil off all that water. This filter can go in the trash. We're gonna cook this copper carbonate and I'm going to be over the frying pan for about 15 minutes. You want to have some cooking gloves, barbecue gloves. This chemical reaction that's about to occur uh, does not occur until the copper carbonate has been heated to 290 Celsius. The first thing that's going to happen when I turn on the fire, which I will go ahead and do, and I'm going to leave it on high, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to boil off all this water. It'll start boiling soon. The next thing that's going to happen, once the water's all gone, we will have a light blue powder. The carbon, copper carbonate is a light blue powder. Copper carbonate in this reaction is going to convert into copper oxide, a dark brown powder. That's the reaction that occurs at 290 degrees Celsius. And we will have to scrape it the whole time, and that will take a while. So here we go. Now we got rid of the water. This is the part where it gets hot. At this point, most of the copper carbonate, well, all of the water is gone, and there's copper carbonate stuck all over the pan. But the main thing is I've got a little pile of solids here in the middle that are loose. That's what I want. So it's gradually going to change from the green to a dark brown. And holding this little frying pan with your 
and it does get hot so that's why the gloves are important and when one can gets too hot I switch out and use the other hand. You can see the color is changing now from the turquoise color to a darker color. It's because some of the solids have already cop uh, converted to copper oxide. I'm just chopping up the big chunks to help speed them up and keep sweeping everything towards the center. You can see I scraped up quite a bit of Teflon off my pan this time. That's not going to hurt anything. We will keep cooking until all the light colors are gone. We have nothing left but the dark brown copper oxide. After waiting a few minutes for the material in this frying pan to cool down and the frying pan itself, uh, we can now handle it for the next reaction, reaction number four. I cleaned off my spatula and I still have the copper oxide in the center of the frying pan. So I'm going to scrape the copper oxide into this beaker, another 250 milliliter beaker. This is a dark brown powder and we're going to perform the next reaction which is to combine this copper oxide with a little hydrochloric acid. This is a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid, not very strong. So watch what happens when I mix the copper oxide, the brown powder from the, the heating of the copper carbonate. Uh, with the hydrochloric acid. It's turning green and the ground brown powder is vanishing. Now look at that. We have a beautiful blue-green aqueous solution. There are a few black particles floating around there. I'm pretty sure those are bits of Teflon off the pan. The copper oxide is completely gone and now we have a solution of copper chloride. That's what that green solution is. Copper chloride is a salt. It's soluble in water. The reaction gave off carbon dioxide gas like several of our reactions. So that's the end of that one. At this point, we're ready to dispose of this material, but I put probably quite a bit of extra hydrochloric acid in here. So I don't want to just pour, down, pour this down the drain while it's acidic. So I'd like to neutralize it with some baking soda, which I will. But before we do, it might be instructive just to use one of these pH measuring strips and see exactly what the pH is. If the, if the solution is neutral, it, the pH would be 7. If it's acidic, it'll be below 7. And if it's basic, which it won't be, it would be above 7. So the chart on the box shows 0 through 7. These are the different colors the strip will turn to to display different pH values. So I put it in. Bring it over. Oh, it's pretty acidic. You see that dark purple tip and the dark orange. The pH looks like it's pretty low, very acidic. So we don't want to pour that down the drain like that. We want to neutralize it first. I'll just mix in a little baking soda. Baking soda and hydrochloric acid produces water and carbon dioxide. So I'll just mix in a little. You can see it producing carbon dioxide for sure. It's also going to produce something else. Have we seen this material before? Look what we're getting here. 
I might just toss in a little more baking soda. See if there's any uh, acid left. You can see what's um, being developed in this reaction. That is copper carbonate again. Baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. It's got the carbonate ion in it, carbonate ion. We mix that carbonate ion with the copper chloride that was a salt in solution. Guess what? We have copper carbonate again. The same compound that we cooked to start with to get copper oxide. We've just gone full circle. Now that I've completely made copper carbonate, I don't want to pour that down the drain either. What I want to do with it is the same thing we did before we cooked the copper carbonate that we started with. Put this in a funnel with a paper towel or a coffee filter, let the water drain out, and then just wrap it up and put it in the trash. We have one more experiment to do in this project. When we first began, the first reaction we did produced copper hydroxide, that dark royal blue precipitate, and we left it sitting in a funnel to drain. If you leave that sitting there for a couple of days, well, even in one day, you'll notice that bright blue color fading away and the material taking on a dark brown color. If you leave it there for several days, all the blue is gone and all you have left is a dark brown solid. We've just done a reaction with a dark brown solid and this looks kind of suspicious. We have a dark brown solid left over from our earlier reaction. I wonder what will happen if we take that dark brown solid and put some hydrochloric acid on it. We know what it will look like if the dark brown solid is copper oxide because we took the copper oxide right out of the frying pan, put it with the hydrochloric acid, and we made copper chloride, a green aqueous solution. So I've taken some of the brown solid from our copper hydroxide. This used to be the bright blue precipitate that we started with. But after several days, it has turned dark brown. So I carved off a little bit, smashed it up, I'm going to put it in the beaker. Let's put in some, cop some uh, hydrochloric acid and see what happens. We get the fizzing just like we had before. That's copper, uh, carbon dioxide being released. can see it's starting to turn a little blue-green. I'm, I'm continuing to swirl it because the uh, dark brown powder that I took from that funnel and uh, paper towel was pretty hard and dry and clumpy. So it's, it's taking a moment for those dark brown solid particles to dissolve in this aqueous solution. But as it dissolves, you can see it's turning into the same blue-green aqueous solution that we had before. We know what that is. That's a solution of copper chloride, which means that dark brown solid that we got from the copper hydroxide, it was the same cop dark brown solid that we got from cooking copper carbonate. We cooked copper carbonate and got copper oxide. The copper hydroxide turned into copper oxide all by itself, just by sitting in the room. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we, there it is. No, no more dark brown particles at all, not even any Teflon. Just a nice light blue-green solution of copper chloride. I hope you enjoy doing this experiment yourself.